This week is all about you and your work, and I'd like to also start off this week by sharing some of your work. It's extraordinary. For the last, I think it's about three and a half weeks, I've been in a room with a couple of my friends going through your work, looking at thousands and thousands and thousands of maps. And the maps are interesting, but the stories behind them are extraordinary. It's sort of my sense at this point that your work is addressing virtually all of the major challenges that we're facing in this most difficult time in global history. You are coming up with answers. Your work is addressing environmental monitoring and assessment, like these maps on air pollution and water, groundwater, invasive species. You are modeling the world with respect to the potential for new disease outbreaks. You're working in natural resources. You're finding the answers about where to drill for water or where to drill for oil. You're doing mining. And this beautiful map in Mexico showing where best to locate corn is yet just an example of a whole plethora of work that you're, you're doing applying the science of where to making a more productive and sustainable world. You are working in land information, not only managing land parcels, but exploiting that information with things like showing tax productivity, like this interesting map in Wyandotte County, and just visualizations showing patterns and understandings of things. You're working on everything from camera field data collection to telling stories about where it's expensive to live and assessed valuation. Your work in planning and urban design is creating a better, more livable future for cities. The example in the lower right in South Korea is redevelopment. And up in the upper left in Abu Dhabi, creating whole new towns inside of communities. And what's interesting about that one is that it's on the web, completely open, engaging citizens in various ways. GIS is moving into buildings and campuses. We're learning how to make buildings smarter, not simply representation, but look at the analytics, picking where solar would be best located or where noise can be modeled. In transportation planning, it spans the gamut from watching in real time roadway status, like in the example in Mongolia, to the idea of picking the best bus routes. And look at the map in the center, one of my favorite. It's a suitability map that brings many factors together, picking the best place for locating bike sharing sites. And then on the lower right, picking the north passage across, across the Arctic for shipping. Where best should it go? And in this time of changing climate, it's an interesting map. Jess is moving into engineering. Your work is dealing with issues like managing field workers doing mosquito inspection, or in real time observing not only the workers of a city, but look at this one in the center showing public service requests coming in in real time. And this is a pattern that I see throughout all the maps as we're moving from static geography to real-time geography. The red map is perhaps the most interesting of all. Anybody here from South Dakota? There must be, because this map shows frost heaving and the effect in vertical displacement and sidewalks. Just interesting. Utilities and telecommunication work has moved from managing assets to exploiting the digital information, doing things like electrical tracing. Or look at the one in the lower right here from Italy, where they're taking augmented reality out in the field and they can see the pipes in the ground. Isn't that interesting? No? Well, for, it was for me. I thought you guys would get a kick out of it. I mean, it's amazing. And. Business is no stranger to GIS anymore. Over half of American businesses now deploy GIS in meaningful ways. They're using it for supply chain modeling 
and understanding customers and dealerships and competition. And also on the lower left, in Italy, they're using it to optimize logistics, saving huge amounts of money and time, and gasoline, by the way. Your work in public health are telling stories, stories about opiate risk to high school students across the United States, or showing simple things like flu epidemics, or long-term issues dealing with cardiac arrest by neighborhood. And here again, we see real-time geography coming alive, the status of homeless in cities, and also the Kenya presidential elections in near real time. Your work in public safety is making our cities safer. Crime, spatial temporal crime analysis, and up in the upper right, the Situation Awareness Super Bowl. But here, my favorite map is the one in the lower left showing the allocation of public funds. It's a model. It's not where they went, it's where they should go based on many factors. Preparing for, well, and responding to disasters is work that many of you are doing, from earthquakes to hurricanes to wildfires and floods. It's not simply providing the status, which is so rich, but it's modeling. In the floods in Texas a few months ago, we saw in advance where the floods are going to go using GIS modeling. And in the lower right, we see modeling at a different time frame, where climate change affecting sea level rise will affect different kinds of coastal communities. Portals have opened up ArcGIS and your, your data to a whole new world. It's beginning to engage citizens. I mentioned already Abu Dhabi having their one-stop e-government hub. It's just breathtaking. But I was taken by the city of St. John's Creek here who have smart devices. What's it called? Alexi. Where a citizen, yeah, right. I was going to call her uh, Donna or something, but it's Alexi. Alexi, tell me about my property. When are they fixing the streets, etc.? A whole new dialogue is going to open up. And things like adopt a storm drain or zoning comments, we're connecting the whole community using, using your tools. And these beautiful maps illustrate the kind of cartography that's now possible. This beautiful map from Switzerland is one of my favorite. Swiss Topo always takes the, takes the prize at this conference. But look at the wonderful wall planning chart of Europe. And then up in the upper right, looking at microscopic or beyond microscopic DNA mapping. And we're going to hear about that more later today at one scale. And at the other scale is NGA's work where they have now digitized the whole world with two billion features in a database. And they update it 100,000 times a month. Story maps have opened up your cartography to a whole new world. There are now over 600,000 stories that you have published with millions and millions of viewers every week listening to the stories that you tell about tree mortality in California or the peace agreements in Colombia or the impacts of ocean currents on pollution or mundane things like, well, it's not so mundane for people from Iowa, but bridge conditions. In other words, story maps are opening up a new language. And by the way, all these maps, in a way, are, are stories. They're stories of the content, the ones that I shared and you saw. But there's also a story behind every map, which is the story about your work, which from me, from my perspective, after spending a month looking at all of your work, I'm just totally blown away. And it's unbelievable what you are doing. And I just wanted to take a moment and acknowledge you for that, for those efforts. Each year, we pick about 1 50th of 1% of our users around the world, and we give them something called a SAG Award. It's not the movie business. It's Special Achievement in GIS Award. <laughs> a different kind of SAG. These are the award winners this year domestically. 
and these are the award winners internationally. We're going to have a special ceremony on Wednesday afternoon, and you're all invited to this ceremony. But I'd like to take a moment and have all the SAG Award winners please stand up so we can acknowledge you in front of your peers. Could you do that for me right now? I like giving acknowledgement. It's kind of nice, doesn't it? Doesn't it feel good when you get acknowledged? You know, you're really good at something? That's part of it. But the purpose of the SAG Awards goes deeper than that. It's for all of us to learn from those people, those special people who have done the hard work, the people who were the last to leave the parking lot at night. They worked their butt off <laughs> to get done what was necessary. So it's a great pleasure to acknowledge you and Find those people in the audience and go talk to them, because they have done something extraordinary to get this achievement. Each year, we also pick one user from around the world to give what we call the Enterprise GIS Award. And this year, it's being given to an organization very close to us here in San Diego. It's Simpra Energy. One organization two companies, the Southern California Gas Company and San Diego Gas and Electric. And I'm going to have a short video so that you can understand better why we're giving this award this year. Could you roll it, please? We are the largest local distribution company in the United States. We serve pretty much the southern half of California. That's six million accounts, but behind that are 20 million customers. And it includes major production facilities, includes refineries, electric generation plants, as well as homes that need heating and restaurants that need cooking. So on an average day, we will send out to customers for their use over a couple billion cubic feet of natural gas. Safety is our top priority and it's our core value. So having the GIS enterprise approach actually makes me sleep a little better at night because we're not scrambling to chase down information. We know where to go. We know where that portal is. We know where that information is. It gives me peace of mind knowing that there's that single source, but also gives me peace of mind knowing that we can get to it quickly. It's not a piece of paper in some file drawer, right? We're not chasing it down somewhere in some office 100 miles from here. It is networked, it's mobile, and we can access it. The top advantage of having Enterprise GIS is taking not just geographic data, but taking different departmental information and bringing it onto one platform. So as we move forward, there's data that's sitting as Word documents. There's data sitting as Excel spreadsheets. There's data sitting as links on websites, as well as geographic information. They all need to talk to one another. They need to work together because it's about the same company. Having the enterprise platform helps us integrate that information, run models, run reports, and to make good decisions for the customer. Amazing, isn't it? <laughs> yeah. Could you guys come up? To receive this award today, Jimmy, Katie, Deborah, are you guys going to come up or where, where are you sitting? Come on up, please. <laughs> and let's, I've got a couple of awards. <laughs> Jimmy, thank you. Congratulations. Hey, Deborah. Yeah, nice to see you. Well, I have two awards, actually, because one is for one company, one is for the other. So are you, are you getting this one or are you getting this one? Um, You'll see. take either. <laughs> Here you are. Anyway, did you I, want to say something? I, I just want to thank you. And it's an honor to be recognized. But personally, I want to thank you for the leadership, the example you set. And because you do that, the trust and collaboration our teams are able to achieve to make the world a better place. And it's really because of you, and Thank I want to acknowledge you. that. I appreciate Thank it. Thank you very much. much. <laughs> mm -hmm. Thanks. Yeah. And, and, and behind this guy, Debbie, she's the one who actually made it. Oh, no, okay. <laughs> she and a lot of other people, but uh, yeah, anyway. Yesterday, we talked at the executive track about that word trust, and I quoted a quotation. I'll, I'll try to remember it. It's, Collaboration happens at the speed of trust. 
really amazing quotation because it, it embodies, I wanted to share that quotation because it embodies exactly what makes GIS work. When we trust each other in your teams, with your management, it really works. Thank you, guys. See you, Jimmy. The next award is our Leadership in Government Award. And this year, it's been given to Governor John Hickenlooper, who originally was a petroleum geologist. He's kind of like one of ours, not a geographer, but kind of a geologist. <laughs> he became a businessman, then he became mayor of Denver and served several terms there and integrated GIS into government in an extraordinary way. And then he became governor. And for the last eight years, he's been likewise following a kind of passion, spatializing government. I really like this guy, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome, Governor Hickenlooper. Come on up. <laughs> Thank you, Dad. Yeah, here we are. Well, John, do you want to say anything? Well, just a moment to, to thank you and, and your wife, Laura, and, and everybody here. Pat Cummins, who's been such a great persistent persuader to help our team see more of the possibilities. In a funny way, Esri is a, a convener. You know, I always think it's the trinity of private sector, public sector, and civil society that really gets things done. And I guess it was over 50 years ago, Marshall McLuhan said that the medium is the message and maps are a medium, and that information is power. It's not, pow not political power, but it's the power to do good. And I think everyone in this room, you are all problem solvers. And I mean, I'm a problem solver. I like to work with the smartest, best people I can find, and I like to have the best tools. And you guys are all problem solvers on your own. You're creating the best tools, and I think the whole country owes you a debt. So thank you to all. Good luck. <laughs> I'll be around. <laughs> See you. It's great. As you know, I get a chance to meet with a lot of leaders around the world, and uh, it's my experience that, that uh, Governor Hickenlooper is one of those very special people. He has a talent of leading, but not some elitist leading. He's, he connects, or at least he connects with me, that's for sure. The final award this year is my award. I get to give this each year. I get to pick it. And this year it's being given to the American Red Cross. This is an amazing organization, ladies and gentlemen. Of course, we all sort of know it at a distance because once in a while we get touched by it. But I had the opportunity this year to go deep into their organization to see once what they were doing in Texas and in Florida. I watched them save, literally save people's lives and also just make it more comfortable for everybody during these terribly crises that were in the news, of course. But what you probably don't know is that the American Red Cross is a all-volunteer organization with tens and tens of thousands of organizations across America working all the time. So, Harvey, Brian, could you come up? I, I'm greatly pleased to be able to give this award to you guys. This is quite an award. Yeah. It's really my pleasure. Thank you, Thank you, Harvey. You, you have no idea what these guys' life are like. I mean, they work tirelessly around the clock. And they have, they use GIS across their volunteer organization. They have thousands and thousands of users that, that you just can't imagine how it comes together. Did you want to say something, Harvey? Just a couple things. First, as passionate as we are about GIS, we're more passionate about the outcome of using GP GIS. And really, it's uh, hundreds of thousands of people across the country who have their worst day in a disaster. Uh, we do a better job of preparedness, a better job in response and recovery because of the tools we're able to apply in RC View, our version of GIS. Second thing that Jack talks about all the time is it's a team sport. And so really, uh, Brian and I are here, and really I'm here with Brian's benefit and we have thousands of Red Cross volunteers who are as excited as anyone in this room about what we're doing with RC View, our version of GIS. And so we accept the award certainly on behalf of, uh, of our Red Cross team. 
and then, Jack, you've got hundreds of your people that we just call, and, and as we people deploy to a disaster to help support our team and help support those that we serve, and it's the Red Cross team, it's the Esri team, and then I invite 18,000 people here, I invite you and your organization, if you identify with the slide Jack showed about preparedness and response and use of GIS, we're looking for partners too of data that we can share and techniques we can learn. And so I think it is a team sport all focused on just a huge outcome that benefits our country and our response and recovery. Thank you very much, Harvey. Thanks, that's great. Thank you. Beautiful. Yeah. And their invitation is quite serious. When I went into their, let's call it a bunker, where they're running the command and control, there are all these volunteers, little volunteer NGOs, government agencies like the Texas Emergency Group. They're all collaborating, bringing, using your science of where together to be able to address the big challenges. We are making this year's Making a Difference Award to two young ladies who some of you have met before, Alice M. and Mariana Ramirez. Are you guys here? Can you come out now? Let's hear it for them. These are two amazing teachers, ladies and gentlemen. Where are they? Oh, they're not coming out. Here we go. <laughs> wow. Here we go. Okay. Oh, Rugwoods. <laughs> you don't, well, many of you don't know who these young ladies are. They work in Boyle Heights at a school called, yeah, kids from there. <laughs> What are you going to say to that? Oh, well, I don't know. <laughs> These two young ladies have been working together as a team of two for the last eight years in this little bungalow school house. They have adjacent rooms next to each other. And anyway, I can go on and on. But actually, what I'd like to do is show a little video, which you guys have not seen. We haven't. Okay, well, let's show it now, please. And then you guys will know why we're doing this award. What's up, this is Will I Am. I'm here in the area that I grew up in, Boyle Heights, in the school that my family went to. Now we have magnet program and an Esri GIS, Geographical Information Systems program. When I was transitioning from dreaming in the projects about having a career in music, I live right here on Figure Street, behind the laundromat. Education was the spark that altered a course because we could have just ended up a statistic. I would like people from Boyle Heights to go to MIT, to Stanford. I met Jack Dangerman. Welcome to my family. You got a great family. He had this awesome technology. Type in like 90023 and you could ask this system anything. Like how many people voted that's been in jail um, that are diabetic? I was like, yo, type into the map how many drive-bys happened in the past five years. He was like, we don't have that information. I was like, exactly. Let's teach my kids how to create maps. That way they can input things that they see in the community. That was an idea. And gonna transform America. Started here at Roosevelt. Check it out. Geography is, for me, one of the most important social sciences there is. Without geography, we don't understand who we, who we are or where we come from. Science of where is, is what I'm teaching students, to identify a problem or issue in their community, to collect data, visualize their data through maps, and then take action. The service learning project, it's a graduation requirement. The goal of the project is for you to be proud of your community, proud of your families, proud of your culture and heritage. It's completely different, this type of work that we do. Students are active in their own learning, so as a teacher, I am there as a coach, guiding them through the research process. Step one is the students have to pick a question or an area of research. So we're looking at the relationship between American gun culture and school shootings uh, following Columbine. Students are researching those issues that impact them. We all had in common a family member or someone close to us being incarcerated and we were really interested in researching that topic. Environmental issues, they're researching injustices in the educational system. 
So we decided to settle on the 1968 walkouts because it happens in our community. It's focusing on education back then and how that impacts our education now. And then the next step is actually research design. What are the data pieces that will begin to answer their question? The data that you need will be here somewhere. It may not be in a form that you recognize it, right? But you need to be able to work on those skills of like, what, what conclusions can I draw from this? Who are credible sources and who are going to be biased sources? I have family members who have been inside the facilities, so we got an interview from the family members, and that helped us with the regulations, with how they feel. We asked students to conduct an interview with two to three experts. Right from the get-go, we started to go around Cesar Chavez. We surveyed every individual business that we can find. So we had in total around 150 data points. It really challenges them to speak to professionals, to community organizers, right? And it puts them at the center of the work. After they collect the data is the mapping part. That's really challenging because it actually requires a lot of quantitative data and how to visualize it and how to actually get it to tell a story. Like putting different components on one map, it can really show like a relation between things that you wouldn't like, think of connecting. Like I wouldn't have thought of connecting population to school shootings. It's making learning that much more exciting. We're adding student stories to a map. We're adding our lives to a map. Could even be emotional for, for some people when they see themselves in a map. Yeah, crimes happen, but when mapped, like, it's like a whole different interpretation. Like, you see it and you're like, wow, like, I would have never thought this and that about my community. So I, I, I thought mapping was really changed the game for us. So as you might know here in Boyle Heights, we are more likely to have powder cocaine to heroin. Pretty sure you guys have seen it all around in your neighborhood. Now it's, how do we make sense of all this? Was our hypothesis true or false? Why or why not? The students present to students and to a panel of teachers. At the end of the year, the kids culminate with a trip to Esri where they present their findings to the company of GIS professionals. As an English teacher, you're teaching students the basics of argument. So when the students are able to collect data and visualize it, they're really empowered to advocate for changes. Thank you. They can show the series of maps to people in government offices. We began to use that hashtag, Maptivist. What our team is doing is creating some sort of merchants association. We just want the community to be better and hopefully implement a business improvement district by the end of the summer. At the end of the day, you're right. Like a bunch of teenagers probably can't fix all of the world's problems, but knowing that they're all gonna go and be educated and assume these positions of power where they can really advocate for their communities is a great, goal. I would advocate for teachers to engage in really thoughtful and meaningful education and that's what I think our project is about. I feel like it's a much deeper lesson than just research. It shows them too that there's there's so much humanity in loving your community and loving each other in order to, to find these solutions. The students over here, look at them. There you go, students. They're all up here crying. <laughs> Do you guys want to talk? Well, we, we talked about um, the importance of, of partnerships that respect public education and respect the work of teachers and students. And we really appreciate the partnership that we have with you because you, you gave us this tool and you said do with it what you, what you desire. And what we desired is to put students of color at the center of decision making, right? Where students get to claim their, their futures, they get to imagine their futures through map making. And that's really important work. It's transformative work. It's the work of freedom.
Wow. <laughs> this is what one of their students wrote me and said. These, there are teachers who teach because it's what they are passionate about. But then there's teachers who teach not only because they are passionate, but also because they are destined to change the lives of those students they teach. It goes on and on, but I don't think I could make it through. <laughs> <laughs> These two teachers remind me of what John F. Kennedy once said, one person can make a difference and everybody should try. And you, ladies and gentlemen, I mean, should acknowledge these teachers because they're pioneering this whole science of wear in K through 12 education. They will be heard of again and again in the future. Thank you so much for gracing us with the opportunity to acknowledge you in this way. Thank you, guys. Thank you. Ladies and gentlemen. Okay, go now. <laughs> it's great. And we want to do it again and again and again in every school around the world. Create a next generation of people. And it requires teachers. And those teachers need supporters, people exactly like you, geo-mentoring, taking, taking the responsibility, inspiring what's next. Thank you.